today we're going to be discussing animating the doctor where because uh, since 2003 we have had uh animated episodes of the doctor um you know come out uh, some have been uh you know uh re pre-framing missing episodes uh so that people can watch them uh some have been originals um anyway i've got a full crew here to talk about it um so let me introduce and i'll go ahead and start with uh anthony uh why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself good morning um my name is anthony williams i am a long-term doctor who fan been following the show since about 1992 and uh, I'm of the cast members of the Watchers in the Fourth Dimension podcast, and I am delighted to be here this morning. Okay, and how about uh, you, Alan? Let's go with go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey there, my name's Alan. I run a uh, Atlanta-based convention called Hulanta, and I'm also a author and publisher, uh, owning CosmicPress.com. All right, and then our fourth fourth guest here. Uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I am Brian Dube, also a long-term Doctor Who viewer since sometime in the 1980s. Uh, I am a co-host with the British Invaders podcast, where we've been running for about uh, 14 years now, and uh, we've covered well over 150 different uh, British sci-fi TV show. So fun stuff over there. So we've got a well-experienced crew here to talk about animating the Doctor. Now, the first episode that was animated was way back in 2003. It was an original, uh, and the original plan was it was going to be canon. That mm -hmm. was before... Right. That was before... Uh, Russell T. Davies announced that he was bringing back the show in live action with Christopher Eccleston. Yep. Uh, but the this very first one was called Scream of the Shalka, and it featured Richard E. Grant as the doctor. And, uh, you know, I was just uh, out of curiosity, what are your thoughts on that one uh, in particular? Uh, Alan, let's start with you. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's... Uh, it was interesting at the time because the Russell T. Davies thing was, was like in the wings when this came up. This was intended to be the continuation of the series. Richard E. Grant was the ninth doctor. Um, and then the Russell T. deal came along and they basically let this thing go out as a test market kind of thing. Um, and it got like so many views that the BBC servers crashed and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was an overwhelming success. And I thought it was really great. Uh, my favorite aspect of it uh, is the master. And for anybody who has not watched it, um, go watch it. And I'm not going to spoil it for you. But the thing that they did with the master was fascinating. And I would love to have seen that developed. But unfortunately, Russell T said, hey, we're going to do a new show. So they cut the Richard E. Grant series off at the first story. And that was all we ever got. Very disappointing. Okay, Brian, what, what did you think of uh, Scream of the Shalka? I enjoyed it. It's uh, great as a standalone, uh, standalone adventure and a peek into another doctor that we only got to see briefly. But I think it's also fascinating looking at it in context at what it was doing at the time. This was the 40th anniversary uh, celebration of Doctor Who when there was no Doctor Who going out. Yeah. So it was a way to do Doctor Who and do something new with it while not really quite doing Doctor Who, you know, while not doing a live action broadcast series. And it uh, gives you something that is, uh, you know, fits into a very different slot than we have for almost anything else. And while the TV movie with Paul McGann gets the most of the credit for bridging the classic series to the new series, yeah. this does some of that too. It absolutely does. 
Well, one of the things I like was the fact that Derek Jacoby did the voice of the master, yeah. you know, yeah. which not, not a lot of people realize, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Anthony, what are your thoughts on Scream of the Shulka? So, uh, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I was slightly disappointed in that I think Richard E. Grant kind of phoned in his performance, in all honesty. He's not the best doctor hey, we've ever you. had. I believe uh, Russell T. Davies has described it exactly the same way. Yeah. In yeah. those same words. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, Richard E. Grant has a habit of doing that, uh, to be honest. It's not just with this. It's, it's just something that he does. Um, and I, I remember at the time, uh, I had some friends who actually worked on, on BBCI and the Doctor Who website. And, you know, as, as was mentioned, this was billed initially as the official continuation of Doctor Who. Richard E. Grant is the ninth Doctor. Yeah. And they were quite miffed about it when <laughs> when plans for a tv show came out because the left hand and the right hand of the bbc weren't weren't talking exactly so they had no idea the announcement was coming out yeah and the first they heard about it was when it hit the press whether that was the online press or the print press and they were like oh okay so we've just spent all this money with cosgrove hall to make this animation mm -hmm. and it's no longer official and okay. and the and BBC <laughs> and BBC proper basically just kind of sat back and let this thing go out just mm -hmm. to see how it would perform, right. and it exceeded all expectations yeah. with its popularity and the number of hits. They released each episode six episodes, uh, one per week, and I mean it just went gangbusters. Yeah, yeah, and it was a t at a time when animation on the internet was something you could almost do <laughs> you know you could get away with doing it but a lot of how the animation was done was based on what the technology could do at the time and a lot of that being what people's home internet connections could do at the time yeah. uh you know you couldn't do something like uh you know a broadcast television cartoon and have that as something that people could uh, could watch on their home internet in 2003. Well, particularly, Brian, to that point, if you look at what they had tried to do, because this was the fourth yeah. kind of animated Doctor That's Who right. that, yeah. that BBC I had done, but I think it's a mm -hmm. bit generous to call um, Death Comes to Time, Real Time, and Sharda animation because yeah, they were right. basically glorified slideshows to audio this this was the right. first proper animation and to your point brian you know i think um broadband dsl connections weren't that common i remember trying to yeah. stream the damn thing on uh, on a 56k <laughs> modem <laughs> so oh the good old yeah. days <laughs> Do, well, you go even older, you know, you doing dial up <laughs> with a rotary phone. <laughs> no less. Um, Uphill both ways in the snow, indeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, after Scream of the Shulka, um, during the David Tennant era, they actually did two two more originals. They did the Infinite Quest and Dreamland, and. You know, to refresh my memory, I actually watched both of those recently. Um, and my personal opinion is I thought the Infinite Quest was the better of the two. It's uh, fantastic. Bo yeah. Bo both animation wise and story wise. Uh, but I, I'm anxious to hear, hear your thoughts. Uh, what did you guys think of the two David Tennant originals? Uh, uh, Brian, let's start with you. I enjoyed them. I think the first of the two was a Cosgrove Hall animation. Yeah, uh, the um, animation company known for Danger Mouse, among other things. Uh, yeah, b uh, big deal in the UK. And the second one moved to uh, more, uh, you know, moved to a computer animated platform and I thought I enjoyed both of them, but I liked the animation and the first one better. That was my thought when I was watching both of them recently was the animation in the computer one, the dreamland one was just not quite there for me. 
So yeah, and I think this was right around the time when when Cosgrove Hall went under when they stopped operations. So uh, you know, it was something that was available to them for that first one, this sort of classic approach. While by the second one, I'm not sure that uh, they were still able to do that. Hmm. Anthony, what, what what are your thoughts on the two David Tennant animated uh, sh stories? So there's an element of nostalgia with the Infinite Quest for me. Um, I, I was in my first year of, of university when that came out, and I remember it, it was aired in the UK as a segment of a show that went out, I think, on Tuesdays called Totally Doctor Who, mm -hmm. which was right. a behind-the-scenes kind of show that, unlike Doctor Who Confidential, was primarily focused at, at children, I think, under the age of 12. So it was a bit more childish in the way it was presented. It, it, it was very similar to Blue Peter, uh, if anyone's familiar with that show, very high energy. Um, and then they took five minutes across the 13 weeks to put out an episode of, of The Infinite Quest. And that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the show, or the infinite quest in particular was a lot more mature than the rest of totally doctor who it had a great cast and i really enjoyed yeah. it when it came to dreamland um i actually had to even um refresh my memory that it existed uh, it was that unremarkable <laughs> to me um i don't oh. remember anything about it other than the the pseudo cgi animation that was just not great and something about area 51 maybe i'm not sure ah, um, right <laughs> best forgotten in my opinion sorry to anyone out there who likes it okay it's alan alan what are your thoughts on the two david Tennant special animated specials same <laughs> <laughs> no seriously uh um the second one is okay it, it's it's got an okay story it's you know got the fun of having georgia moffett as the uh, main sort of companion character. Um, but, you know, everything you guys said is exactly right. Um, whereas the first one is just fantastic. It's so inventive. It's so fun. It's fast paced because it was done in these small chunks that each one ends on a cliffhanger. So every five minutes, you're going to get a cliffhanger and, you know, a jump into the next part of the story when you watch it edited together as a 45 minute episode and it's so good. It's just absolutely wonderful. So yeah, I love it. And you know, they, they recently did a, a box set of animated uh, Dr. Who stories. And a lot of people never saw those for some reason, even though they were released on DVD, I kept coming across people who had never heard of either of them. Uh, I was managing a movie and music department at a Barnes and Noble at, uh, at the time, and I was constantly recommending them to people who love Doctor Who and wanted new Doctor Who. I'm like, here are these things, and people looking for Christmas presents, I would say, have they ever seen this? And they're like, I don't think they even know that exists. I'm like, here's your Christmas present. So that's I, what, I love them. I think they're great. That's I had this. Oh, go I ahead, this, Brian. I had the sense that both of them were sort of done on the on the back burner. Like it didn't feel like. Um, it was, uh, you know, the main event in the way that Scream of the Shulka was. It was something that was being done on the side compared to the the live action series, especially well, yeah. with Dreamland. Yeah, I and mean, they were it, gap fillers, definitely. They yeah, served in that in that purpose. And I think it sort of showed a little bit, and then that's in part. Uh, you know, in terms of how it was distributed and marketed, it was sort of something a little on the side, which, well, and uh, certainly, which was, was okay, but I think maybe they suffered a little bit, especially Dreamland, because of well, that. Well, when you say on the side, that certainly is the way that it comes across in North America, but I don't yeah. think that's the way it was marketed or intended in Britain. I, um, I would say, I, I actually, I mean, having been living in Britain at the time, obviously I'm now North America based. I mean, the Infinite Quest, that that was very much a sideshow. Yeah. You know, it, it happened, as I said, as part of Totally Doctor Who, broken up into five minute segments that were airing yeah. at the same time as, as Series 3 was airing. So it, it definitely wasn't the main show. And then Dreamland, I, I want to say, went out as a what they call a red button special um, yeah. on the. On, uh, on uh, cable, 
um, on BBC. So you went in and you pressed the red button and it came up with this list of special features that the BBC were doing at the time that weren't part of their regular broadcast. So it wasn't broadcast primetime BBC One in the same way that Planet of the Dead or The Waters of Mars was. So, I mean, I think that perception that these were kind of sideshows is spot on. They, they certainly weren't ever intended to be the main feature. Yeah, but at least at least the one of them was broadcast. You know, yeah, yeah. it was not here. The only thing we got here was a DVD release. So there really yeah. wasn't the push in, in America. And, uh, yeah. And to that point, Alan, I think, you know, you look at Doctor Who on, on streaming media and, um, you know, those two were not part of what was on Netflix and now yeah. and then yeah. Amazon Prime and now HBO Max. So yeah. the availability is still really the only way to get them is to buy them on shiny disk or to pay well, for a digital download. Yeah, and the digital downloads are quite inexpensive if you look on iTunes and that kind of thing. So there it's, is, it's, it's just not part of yeah. the, the marketing of it. It's not, right. the profile is very low. Yeah. And I think depending how they approached it, it could have been something that was done in addition to the main show and been a little bit more high profile than it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they still, there's some good work in there, certainly with the Infinite Quest. Oh, without a doubt. And I, I think with Dreamland, you know, there, there's a case to be made. That that came out in 2009, so that yeah. was the, the gap year with the specials. Mm -hmm. um, you had the uh, the Sarah Jane adventure story with, with David Tennant in it as well. I think there's yeah. kind of a an informal kind of expanded half season, mm -hmm. if you include Dreamland. Yeah. Yes. And that episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures yes. as, you know, the rest in Tenant's Farewell. Right. But again, another thing about Infinite Quest is that um, it stars David Tennant and uh, Freeman Adman. And it's while they're, you know, working on the series. So they are just like in top form. They are in exactly character mode. It's not like they're revisiting, you know, coming back to those characters. They are like, I mean, and it sounds you know exactly like a, a televised doctor who episode it's so good highly recommended yep and uh, moving on um and then of course in 2006 uh cosgrove hall animated the first two episodes of the invasion and that kind of started a trend there for a while where they yeah. where where you had episodes that were maybe just missing like one or two episodes where they would animate just those episodes yeah, and, and then put them out it, on DVD. It was, ep it was episodes one and four. One and four. Missing ones. Yeah. Right. Um, and what I, the, the, I think the way it happened, and this is what I've heard in various places, is that the funding that, was, that had been allotted to the uh, Richard E. Grant what would have been a, a continuing series. And since that got cut off, that money was just sitting, you know, and that's how it got spent. They, the BBC decided, well, we've got this money that's been allocated for animation. What can we do with it? And this was like a, a test market basically for mm -hmm. doing uh, animations of missing episodes. Well, I, and I remember... it was planned for some kind of broadcast, I believe, which fell through mm. for one reason or another. I, I don't know was, if that was Red Button or what, but it was planned for something rather than a DVD release. If I recall correctly, it was originally planned for broadcast on BBC Four, which was their that kind of more sense. educational documentary yeah. archive mm -hmm. channel. The um, challenging material. Right. <laughs> and I, I remember being in on a lot of the forums at the time and, and the buzz around this and the push amongst us of, hey, everyone, make sure you go out and buy the invasion on DVD because if this yep. is a, a success, we might get more. Exactly so, right. Um, <laughs> most of us were buying all of the DVDs at the time anyway because it's a Doctor Who right. forum and we're all complete nerds yeah. and, and buy everything. Stick, stick the logo on, we'll buy it. Um, exactly right. But <laughs> what I what I remember from the time is that the invasion didn't sell, you know, incrementally more than any other dvd yeah. did and and it performed about the same level that any other Troughton release or black and white release yeah. would have anyway so you know yeah, so they have they have a captured target audience and that's who's going to buy their stuff yeah because it took several years before they started doing some of the other ones like the moon base and then the 
coupled with uh, William Hartnell, the Reign of Terror, Reign of and, Terror. Yeah. And, and the Tenth Planet. Yeah. I think so, it's about, uh, the, and the Ice Warriors as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually enjoyed having those because it was a lot nicer than you pop in the DVD to watch the DVD and then you have to, you know, get off to go watch the missing episode on your computer uh, because that's where you've got it. You know, and then you go back to watching the DVD. So it was nice having it all on a DVD, and it was nice having them animated. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, absolutely. I think, I think with the invasion, even today, and this is clearly a function of it being made by Cosgrove Hall. I think it's the highest quality animation of missing <laughs> episodes that we've had. Yeah, candidly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I was talking with Anthony before we started recording. I said one of my favorites of those that are is the Reign of Terror, just because not because the animation's great, but because they actually did a historical. You know, because mm -hmm. I'm a I'm yeah. a big I'm a big fan of historicals, and you know the fact that you know they actually animated one of the historicals was great. You know, yeah. you know because they seem to be focusing mostly on. Uh, on the uh what you call it the uh troutton era so yeah. uh although recently if the news is true they might actually start doing some uh hartnells if if the rumors are true well they're Yay, going to be Galaxy anyway yeah, agreed <laughs> and and they definitely are going to be doing hartnells it's just that you know you've they're they're the focus currently is on troutton because they have those digital puppets mm -hmm. already built for that group of characters so let's move. Let's go ahead and move on. I, I wanted to save the most time for the most recent stuff because, uh, uh, let's be honest, that's what most people are. I think are watching this are going to be interested in. So in 2016, they uh, announced and they put out a complete, fully six, all six episodes animation of Power of the Daleks. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I just want. I, I just wonder what, what what was your initial opinion of the animation once you finally saw it. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Anthony on this one. Oh, I loved it. Um, I think Power of the Daleks was a very. It's almost got a mythical status in fandom. Obviously, it's the first Patrick Troughton story. Um, it unfortunately draws a lot of comparison uh, with the evil of the Daleks being one of two mostly missing. Trout and Dalek stories. Uh, and as a child, I, I had both of them on audio cassette and preferred evil. But once I actually saw it animated and rewatched it, it suddenly clicked for me. And it's a very, very simple story that just works so, so well. I mean, David Whittaker was a genius. Yeah. And Agreed. the yeah. animation is, is great. Um, you know, uh, Charles Norton and the team did a, a really good job, particularly if you if you go and watch the uh, the special edition that they recently did of the story as well. I was going to ask how many of you have actually seen the special edition. I have not yet. Okay, it's it's quite different. Yeah, I I, I have it sitting on my shelf. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say there are enough changes to the animation that it's it's worth uh, you know two and a half, however many hours of yeah. your time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the the original one was good. I really enjoyed it, and I liked the idea of doing a whole serial like that. And what they were moving towards at that point was rather than just recreating something, trying to get it as close as they could to original to the original version that's now missing. This was more leading into a reimagining and making something new and something, you know, where there would be a color version as well as a black and white version and widescreen and multi channel surround sound and the rest of it. <laughs> and, they, you know, they could um, come up with something that had a really nice combination of being old and 1960s Doctor Who, but being something new and different at the same time. And yep. I really liked how they started to move into that with power. What what 
I think we all need to remember with Power and why they did a special edition is the original release was done under a time crunch. They yeah. thought oh, yes. they had about, they thought they had a little longer than they did, and then suddenly someone yeah. at the BBC realised, well, if we if we speed mm-hmm. this up, and it, the time frame was already tight, and they said, well, right. if we speed this up, we can get this out on on the story's fiftieth anniversary. So yeah. they suddenly yeah. took that time frame and shrunk it. And so Charles Norton and team were, were never quite happy with the finished product. Yeah. Um, and, and if you if you look at it, the earlier episodes of it are not quite as well animated as the later ones. Yeah. And that's sort of a sign of it being that that rush. And they did get it out for the 50th anniversary of Power of the Daleks. They had a mm-hmm. thing at the time where if you retweeted something on Twitter, you could get to see the the first six minutes i think it was at the exact 50th anniversary uh for free online what was nice about it is the the big pr push that it got you know and and that was part of the move to getting it released on its 50th anniversary and and i was really excited about the way that the BBC was treating the release, like they really did it as a prestige release and it got a, a cinema, you know, broadcast uh, before the DVD came out or no, before the, before the uh, iTunes release or whatever it was. And then the DVD came out and I just, it, I, I really enjoyed the, the excitement of the way the BBC was treating it. Yeah. And I think a chunk of the funding for it was also by the fact that BBC America was broadcast. Oh, absolutely. BBC America has been involved in all of these. Yeah. That's been the absolute game changer, has been the co-funding from from the BBC. Because if if you take a look back, and Mark, I know you're steering us in the direction of the newer ones. But you look, you look back at the the invasion, um, the reign of terror, the moon base, etc., to entertain who were the company responsible for the dvd releases in the uk at the time their their leader was a a gentleman by the uh the name of dan hall his attitude was anything more than two episodes was cost prohibitive right we were never going to get something like power under that regime absolutely Um, he he had this attitude of okay the invasion raised the bar so we can't ever do a reconstruction release until he left and then they decided to put out the underwater menace with a reconstruction release which was terrible um (laughs) and then 2016 bbc america came in as as was pointed out with that co-funding um and a lot of what alan was just describing in terms of the pr push was predominantly on this side of the atlantic it power and and its subs and the subsequent releases never got a tv broadcast in the uk I don't yeah. believe that there may have been one BFI cinema screening, but it wasn't a, a nationwide movie theater showing like we had here. Oh, so I, I thought the cinema showings were UK and North America. But... I think they just did a BFI. I could be wrong, but I think they just did okay. a BFI showing um, for Power. I think there might have. I think for Power, they might have done a little more than that, but all of okay. the subsequent ones, they they haven't. No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so but it, you're right. You there know, were it, definitely it, some where they were getting American cinematic releases much wider than they were getting. Because they were getting that American money. One. Yeah. But the, the other thing with, with power is, you know, Brian, I think it was you that mentioned color. The, the color on power was done as an afterthought. So that was the yeah. only one of the, the more recent ones that was made in black and white and then colorized yeah. later. Yeah. Whereas Macra, Fury, um, etc., have been made in mm-hmm. in color and in then color. Uh, and then de- desaturated. <laughs> desaturated. So that's the word. I was well, I, thank you, Alex, I I think the they actually release. re. I think they actually re-render them in black and white, so it is a little bit better than that. Oh, I know. I'm being. But facetious. yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many of you actually have wa- watched the color? have watched the colors or do you are you are you a purist who just watches the black and whites i am both uh because yeah. bbc america broadcast it before the dvd comes out i watch the bbc america broadcast so i see it in color when i watch it on the dvd i do not watch color i'm a purist i want it in black and white i don't think it ever should be in color but there you go <laughs> i'm I- 
I'm the same way, except I still get the UK release um, on DVD, so I, I get a little bit before BBC America broadcast it. But I, I'm the same way. I'll watch yeah. it in color, more out of curiosity and just to see what they've done. But then I think my go forward viewings will almost always be in black and white. Again, I I, I want it to be to fit the feel of the era. And I know they're yes. obviously reimagining it and putting in sets and things like macro that they could never have afforded yeah. at the time. But right. putting it in black and white still gives it a more authentic feel to me. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, they do some nice things. Like particularly, I remember in Macro Terror, there's some really nice lighting effects mm -hmm. that you get a better sense of in color than you do in black and white. So watching it in, in the mm -hmm. color version is is still fun it's still great but if i watch trout and i want to watch trout in black and white i do what i do watch the color versions is my preference although I'll, I'll look at the black and white as well for sure but i like this idea of the reimagining and doing something new and different that is not the same as uh you know, 1960s Doctor Who as it was. And I I love that we have both. Yes, uh, I I enjoy watching the, the color ones. I think what they've done with color uh, works really well. And uh, on the whole, it's something I've, I've quite enjoyed with it. Yeah, agreed. So anyway, talking about the macro terror, yes. and, you, and you guys are probably know where I'm going with this. Obviously, the animation team decided to drop one, <laughs> you know, one, you know, one uh, scene yep. uh, for various reasons, probably because it was going to be a cost prohibitive to animate. And a lot of fans kind of got went up in arms. Now, oddly enough, when I watched it, it had been a long time since I watched a reconstruction of the Macro Terror. So when I watched the animation, I didn't even realize that there was a missing scene. It didn't really bother me. Yeah. But, you know, and of course, if you do want to watch the scene, it's available on the reconstruction on the DVD. Yeah. And so I was wondering what your guys' thoughts were on them, you know, because in a lot of cases, these are not scene for scene remakes. They, they're doing, you know, they're doing what they can to mm -hmm. you know, get the thing out there. So what are your thoughts on things like that? And are the fans kind of out there for you know getting upset because they cut out one scene in the animation so i think what you need to remember mark is we are doctor who fans we are very <laughs> very particular <laughs> as a true. group of people um and we tend to get up in arms at anything you look at you know the the pushback when matt smith was named as the doctor he's too young you, you look hmm. at the pushback when Capaldi was named as the Doctor. He's too old. old Jody, yeah. She's too female. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, 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 you do anything to, to classic Who, and, and there are going to be people who dislike it. Um, and I think what we need to remember is fundamentally there, there are two reasons for this. One is, as you already said, this is a, a reimagining. It's not meant to be a yeah. faithful... Uh, production to the original. The second thing, and you know, Charles Norton, if, if you ever go on Gallifrey Base and look at the Macro Terra thread on there, you will see how much flack he's got. Uh, poor guy. And fundamentally, you know, that scene would have required new digital assets for the Doctor, Jamie, and uh, Polly and Ben, um, which would have right. made it prohibitively expensive uh, for the amount of time that those assets would have been needed. Right. And on top of that, there were time constraints as well. So I, I get what they did. Um, and if 10 years ago you told me that I could have 98% of the Macro Terra animated, yeah. I would have bitten your hand off, uh, regardless of if they had to cut one scene. You know, I, I think sometimes we forget how lucky we are as fans. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I kind of feel like it, it's, it is a nice scene. It's, it's entertaining and it, and it, sort of says a lot about who the doctor is at the same time it's sort of the tom bombadil of doctor who <laughs> it, it's nice and it would have been nice if it were there but it doesn't affect the story by it not being there yeah exactly i think the fact that we have reconstructions on these the, certainly the dvd and blu-ray right. releases as well is important and it's something that we don't uh, we don't want to miss there and most of these are based on the john cura telesnaps when they're available right 
so we have these more photo slideshow type reconstructions. That is your uh, historical, this is as close as we can get to the original broadcast part of the release. And I think it's uh, important to have that. Agreed. And I this is how you get your, you know, your scenes that they couldn't do or your things that are, you know, these are what the sets actually looked like and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, I and I actually think the reconstructions are getting better. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, I think they've got a new team on it uh, that are doing the actual reconstructions. Multiple uh, teams. Yeah, because I think, uh, you know, like, it has already been mentioned the underwater menace was pretty dire so the reconstruction yeah, I think part. with with these ones they brought in derek handley who yeah. was the driving force behind loose cannon so yeah, yeah since since the underwater menace and then uh the web of fear yeah they've massively upped the game on the recon front which again as brian said that's that's your historical document that's your this yeah. is this is the closest you're going to get, and the animation is is the reimagining. So if you want yes. something that's completely faithful, be a fan. You know, again, we've been used to, to watching reconstructions for the best part of, of twenty odd years. Go and watch the recon. I, yeah. I still do from time to time. Last time yeah, I read and we and we get several different ways to watch the story when we when we get one of the you know when certainly on the dvd and blu-ray releases and i import the uk blu-ray releases for these there's no yeah, blu-ray in, in the in north america but um we get you know a nicely done recon for a lot of these and we also get color and black and white and yep. we get uh commentaries and we get multiple mixes of the sound so you're getting a yeah, lot on here agreed. and the documentaries and things they're doing the supplemental material mm -hmm. uh these are really nice sort of lovingly made um releases that come with a lot in them absolutely but again we're doctor who fans so we'll always find something to complain about no matter well, how sure. lavish the release is absolutely yeah. <laughs> Well, after the Macro Terror, we ended up uh, getting two last year with uh, the Faceless Ones and Fury from the Deep with two different studios, one doing uh, the Faceless Ones and one doing the Fury from the Deep. So, um, Alan, let's start with you. Wh what, what are your thoughts on the Faceless Ones? The uh... Uh, um, it's, it's mostly good. Um, there are little, th you know, and we're talking about budget here and we're talking about time frame that these things are done. Um, I feel like sometimes the character animation, you know, they, it, it's very like early computer anime, you know, it's like computer game kind of thing where they like, they come in and if they're not going to turn a corner, they like very suddenly turn a corner. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not as smooth as it could be. Uh, I really enjoy the story. I really enjoy the animation design. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm not really going to complain about it. I mean, I, 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 I've been, I'm just thrilled that we're getting these things. And, and I think it's a fun story. I really enjoy it. And I think it looks 98, 95% fantastic. So uh, out of curiosity, when you watched it originally, did you watch the, did you watch it with the original episodes, the two that they have? Uh, did you watch it that way, or did you watch it animated all the way through? Well, I'd seen the the two existing ones, uh, you know, many times over the years. Uh, so I watched the whole animation. Okay, yeah, because when I watched it originally, I actually watched it with the two original episodes and watched the four animated, and then yeah. went back and watched the the other two animated. So if any if anything tells us that the idea is making something new rather than reconstructing uh, the past, it's that they're animating a couple of episodes that already existed mm -hmm. and that were not missing. You know, this is the yeah. it's the first one they did uh, in this new run of things that started in 2016, where there were a couple of existing episodes. 
Yeah, and I think I think I think the reason for that is because of the BBC America money. They want it is a hundred percent because of that. They, they want, want a, they want a, a seamless broadcast. Yeah. You know. So Anthony, what are your thoughts on the Faceless Ones uh, reconstruction anime? I I I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, the first time I watched through it was actually for Watchers in the Fourth Dimension because uh, we were close enough when it came out yeah. that I thought mm, I'll watch it until I'll, I'll wait until we get to it in our marathon to actually watch it. Um, so what I did was the missing episodes in black and white animation and then watch the existing ones with it so i had the the originals and i i think what's interesting is they were a bit more restrained in how much they reimagined it because, simply because there is so much more reference material that fans are familiar with so that right. creative license was was a little harder for them right. i think um just because we've seen stuff versus Power or Macro or Fury from the Deep, where there are no existing episodes whatsoever. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think as a story, it's it's very clearly a four part story that's been stretched out to six parts, so it's a little plodding <laughs> right. at times. Um, but that was the the nature of the game in the Trouton era. That happened yep. way more often than the production team would have liked, and that was done for cost reasons, scripts falling yep. through. But Overall, as as a production, I, I enjoyed it. I, I did go back and watch the color version later. Um, but yeah, it, it was good. Yeah. I, I'm Dave. glad we got it. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, the most recent one that's come out is the Fury from the Deep uh, release. So, uh, Brian, let's start with you. What what are your thoughts on the Fury, the Fury from the Deep release? The Fury from the Deep release, I think, is my favorite one of all of them. I really <laughs> enjoy that. And it's a little more, uh, 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 I don't know if I'll say controversial, but it's a little bit more of a uh, love it or you hate it kind of thing because they did uh, go a little more uh, cartoony in some sense. They went for... Uh, definitely animated kind of style. They went for uh, big, bold sets that were uh, far beyond, uh, you know, even compared to what they were doing with uh, with some of the others, far beyond uh, 1960s Doctor Who. And they right. went to character designs that had sort of an animated flair to them as well. And of course, you have you know the story and the um, voice performances of Fury from the Deep, which are fantastic. Uh, so for me, it was one that uh, was really quite special. I really uh, uh, enjoyed what they did with it a lot. So Anthony, what are your thoughts on Fury from the Deep? I, I think I'm almost at the polar opposite to Brian. I have always loved Fury from the Deep as a story. Um, to Brian's point, I think the the voice acting and, and probably just the acting in general was fantastic. The storyline is amazing. But when it came to the animation, firstly, I I don't like that more, more cartoony style. Uh, one thing that I found that really put me off was the uh, the characters that their arms are all way too long, which I found really distracting. It really <laughs> took me. I, I know it's such a small little quibble, but it 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 kept taking me out of it. And then she, <laughs> it was I, too I, I, disarming. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the, the, the other issue I had, and and I think this is where Brian and I really are at polar opposites. One thing I've always loved about that story is how claustrophobic it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. All through it, and then in the animation, they come and they and give it these big, expansive sets. Yeah. Which for me take away from that claustrophobic feel. Um. And yeah. again, it, it it's it's. I guess this is the same reason it took me like five years to watch the Harry Potter movies when they started coming out, um, because it it wasn't how I always viewed the story as being. So that was always my fear with the Harry Potter movies. It was going to be different to the vision I had in my head. That was absolutely the case with Fury. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a long way from my favorite. And, and I feel like Big Finish Creative dropped the ball on that one, which I was surprised about because they'd done the Tenth Planet and and uh, the Moon Base and their efforts previously had been excellent. 
So not not my favorite in terms of the animation, but I still have a huge, huge, huge soft spot for the story. So, Alan, what are your thoughts on Fury from the Deep? Um, my first thoughts uh, are that at the last Gallifrey one that I went to, which was two years ago, no, one year ago, it was two Februarys ago, um, the the uh, the team were at the convention and they did a big panel about the animations and they did uh, test footage and character design and all that kind of stuff from these two stories. So it was the first taste that we got of what was to come in both of these releases. And it was so exciting and it looked so great. And I, I don't know, I really enjoy, I do agree with what Ant Anthony is saying, but I, I do really enjoy the way, um, underwater or whatever it is came out uh, fury that's what i'm trying to say fury from the deep um i, I really do and I, I i enjoy it I, I i do get the lack of the claustrophobic sense but I don't, I don't know how else you would do it in you know making it into a widescreen thing and 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 not lose that so i, I don't know i loved it i i really enjoyed it yeah, it, it, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of that story in particular, so yeah. I enjoyed being able to see it. So I do think and, and I don't know how they would have done it any differently, but the big iconic scene of Mr. Quill and Mr. What's his name coming in to uh, uh, the wife's room and doing the <laughs> just doesn't work in animation the way those the way those actors did it oh my gosh that is so freaking creepy the way the actors yeah. pulled that off and it, it's it's I nice do, in the animation I but do it doesn't like the version of the animation but yeah you can never meet what they actually no. did no it's it's lucky we still have that clip absolutely that was one of the australian sensor clips it was yep. censored in right. australia and the bits they cut out were retained and eventually recovered. Right. So we uh, so we have some anonymous uh, Australian censor to thank for that clip. Exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. As is as is the case with a lot of things like the Hart and Elsa Troughton regeneration. You know, it's because it got used in a news program and lots of news programs. Yeah. And those clips exist. So even if the episode didn't, we still had the clip of the actual uh, regeneration, which is amazing. Yeah. Well, we're getting pretty close to the end of our time here. Um, so there's been a few announcements of possible future animations. Um, I believe they've possibly announced working on Abominable Snowman, uh, Evil, of, Evil of the Daleks, and I do know that they're animating Web 3. Um, yes. So, and then, of course, the re recent rumored announcement of them doing galaxy four yeah so which of those uh would you say you're looking forward to the most so i i do want to say that web three is the only one that has been officially announced yeah i i so understand that so. everything else is speculation at this point it's looking likely but yeah yeah, yeah. anyway i'll let everyone else speak before i get my thoughts <laughs> okay <laughs> uh how about Brian? We'll go with you first. Which one? Which one of those are you looking forward to the most? I'm looking forward to all of them, but especially to Galaxy Four, which is a story I like more than most people. It seems I quite yeah. enjoy Galaxy Four, uh, but I also want to see uh, them do a Hartnell story. I want to see the First Doctor and Vicky and Steven. Uh, I'm interested to see what they'll come up with for the Chumblies as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the one of the things that have been mooted as likely possibilities. That's the one that has me the most interested. Yep. What about you, Alan? Uh, same. Well, I mean, all of them, of course. I want, and eventually everything will get done. But um, as as far as dipping their toe into Hartnell, uh, this one is the one that makes the most sense because it's uh, very minimal sets. You know, they're minimalistic, so they're easy to do, you know, backdrop animation of. Um, the four, there's only four guest characters. 
So it's a small guest cast and they all basically look exactly the same and are wearing almost exactly the same outfit. So you design one and then you cut and paste three times and then you make tweaks to each one of the copies and you've got your four characters. Uh, the Chumblies are going to look fantastic animated. Uh, the Rills are big, scary monsters that once done in CGI are going to look just as great as the Macra did and the Daleks do and that kind of stuff. So I think it's perfect and I'm excited to see what they come up with and to see what they do with the color. Um, yeah. I can't even imagine how it's going to look in color because when I think of an animated result of this, I think of it strictly as a black and white. Of course, that's how I will watch it every time, except for when it's broadcast on BBC America. But uh, I am looking forward to seeing how they what they do with the color on that, and I, I I really enjoy the story as well. I think it's fun, and I'm 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 so glad we're getting some heart now. Okay, Anthony, uh, you're last now, so. Which uh, which one are you looking forward to the most? So I've always always had a massive spot soft spot for Evil of the Daleks. Yeah. As I said, I, it was probably my first uh, exposure to missing episodes. The cassette tape with the narration by Tom Baker was uh, an early Christmas present when I was probably six or seven years old from my parents, and that that cassette tape got so much play <laughs> on my little Walkman and car trips. Um, so for me, that's just uh, that's an old favorite, and I'm very, very excited to see it animated. Um, I still have those tapes. They're great. Tom Baker's narration <laughs> good, is yeah. wonderfully bonkers, um, and he does it in character as the Doctor talking about one of his old right. adventures. It's it's, right. it's just wonderful. And I do hope that when they release it, that that narration is an option on the DVD. Oh, I'm sure it I, will be. I would love I'm to hear sure. that. In terms of Galaxy 4, I think, Alan, what, what you said makes the most sense. And to dig up an old joke, when we did the Missing Episodes panel uh, from Dragon Con last year, on, on Watches in the Fourth Dimension, we, we famously didn't like Galaxy 4. But as we were talking about future animations, we all talked about how much sense it makes, mm -hmm. again, from a cost perspective. And I think, uh, I think it was Don who said, nobody likes this, but it'll be cheap. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think um, also what? it's going to... It's going to uh, just like when Enemy of the World was found, I think this is going to help to sort of like uh, reform the story. It's gonna it's gonna reshape how people think about the story, and I think maybe it will become more you know popular, more enjoyable. And I remember when Airlock was found. Um, what was that episode yeah. three um, back in two thousand and eleven? Yeah. yeah, you know that that brought the story up a little in my estimations. So yeah, I think being able to see it will always do that. Um, right. You know, I always root for if we get further finds of missing episodes, that it's going to be Galaxy 4 or the Smugglers or the Space Pirates for exactly that reason, Alan. Yeah, right. Because Enemy of the World went massively up in everyone's estimation right. once it was found. And I would love to see those stories and see, okay, in terms of the audio, they're not that exciting, but visually they, they're probably quite good. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, I'm excited for what, whatever they put out, but Galaxy 4 probably wouldn't have been top of my list. Dream Hartnell release would be the Myth Makers, but that's going to be a lot more okay. expensive. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Myth Makers, yeah. I want to see. I mean, it's such a wonderful story. Yeah. And it's got so much great humor in it. And, oh, it's just fabulous. And I, really, I can't wait till they actually get to that one. Great yeah, humor well, for three episodes, followed by a massacre in the fourth. Gotta yeah. love it. <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, yeah, we, did, wanna... we didn't get the the crusade because you know that was there were only two missing episodes, but oh, yeah, yeah, it's an expensive one to do. Uh, I also want to comment really quickly on Evil. Uh, I am really excited about Evil, and I think it's going to look fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got so many uh, location changes and mood changes. Um, that it's going to be, it's, it's, you know, technically it's like partially a, a, a historical, but it also jumps into the alienness of, you know, the Daleks in their environment. And I can't wait to see what they do with the big final battle. Yes. Oh, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> oh, that's going to be awesome. So I think one of, I think one of the strengths of the animations is that they're able to take what is, I'll say, a middling story, you know, something like the Macra Terror 
that is a pretty good story, but not a great favorite in most people's estimation and really bring it up a level or even more than a level uh, with, you know, the visuals that can really add the, add some pop to it, really um, make it stronger in terms of atmosphere and in terms of just the way that it plays. So I think for Galaxy 4, maybe you have a little bit of that playing into it too. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, Brian, and I, I realize, Mark, we're running out of time, but, yeah. you know, fandom tends to overlook some of those missing stories, um, but, but some right. of them are fantastic, you know, oh, yes. the Savages, I adore the Savages, and yeah. I think a lot of fandom would reevaluate that and come to a similar conclusion if it were animated or if it and, were found. And I can't wait for that one mm -hmm. to get released in one form or another. I, I'm very excited about that one. Yeah, and I always thought Macro was great, and I'm I'm yeah. glad that fandom yeah. is reevaluating it now that we've got the the animation. Absolutely. Well, anyway, we're running out of time, so I want to give you guys a chance to uh, promote uh, your uh, promote yourselves um, uh, before we go. So, Anthony, we'll go ahead and start with you. Um, where can people find you on the internet? So, as as I've mentioned, you can find me on the Watchers in the Fourth Dimension <laughs> podcast. Uh, we are watching our way through all of Doctor Who from 1963 to now. Uh, after two and a half years, we are finally coming to the end of the Patrick Troughton era, um, and we will actually be doing a panel with Alan at Who Lanta on Yay! May 29th uh, to do a retrospective of the entire Patrick Troughton era. Um, you can also occasionally find me on. Uh, some of Alan's other projects. Uh, <laughs> Alan is our honorary fifth watcher, even though he's he's not a a regular member of the show. He's the closest we have to a to a fifth member. Um, so uh, I like to think Alan and I have quite a, a collaborative spirit between us. Um, Absolutely. Yes, uh, find us on uh, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, wh wherever you wherever you like to get your podcasts, we are probably there. <laughs> well, that's a great segue. Uh, Alan, why don't you uh, let everybody know where they can find you? Okay, well, my publishing company is right here, CosmicPress.com. I have got uh, four Doctor Who books uh, that have one has just come out within a matter of days. Uh, so that one is, is available and brand new and it's uh, very good. Um, but also, I, uh, for the past 16 years, have uh, run Who Lanta, which is a local Doctor Who convention. And uh, we are doing our second virtual convention. We did our first one last May uh, as lockdown was sort of in its infancy. And now that we're coming out of infancy, uh, you know, you're still in the situation where stuff hasn't quite opened up and you don't know. Anyway, so we're doing a second one and it's uh, this coming Saturday, the 29th. And it's an all-day thing, and uh, Anthony and his group are going to be on, and I'm very much looking forward to that. We have a, an original play that's going to be done, and I uh, will have an announcement of the title and everything very, very soon. Um, all kinds of fun stuff. We've got Yiji Cho going to be talking about the 25th anniversary of the McGann movie. We've got... Uh, uh, Graham Harper, who has been associated with the show for decades, he started at the very beginning of Troughton's run, eventually became a director uh, and worked all the way up through the David Tennant seasons. So he directed lots of David Tennant episodes. So we're going to be talking about him and very excited to say that we have a couple of the animators from the animated uh, classic series uh, releases and a uh, the guy one of the guys who directs the documentaries that goes on the uh, complete season Blu-rays. So uh, we're going to be talking about reviving the classic series with these three gentlemen, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Okay, and Brian, uh, where can people find you? You can find me at the British Invaders podcast at BritishInvaders.com, and most anywhere you find your podcasts. We have been running since 2007, uh, having discussed now uh, more than 150 different shows. So we talk about British sci-fi shows and shows from related genres. We talk about the British shows and one-offs and serials, 
that not many people are talking about. So we're filling the, uh, filling you in on uh, on all sorts of fun stuff. And we do, of course, talk about Doctor Who from time to time. And we did something, I think it was last year, we did a two-part discussion about the animated reconstructions of uh, of missing episodes as well. Uh, a lot of the things we've been talking about today. So uh, uh, lots of things we talk, to, we talk about there. Uh, we have one Canadian host, that's me, and one British host. Uh, so we get a nice mix of pers uh, perspectives uh, talking about things um, that were produced, some of them all the way back to the 1950s, and some up to within just the last couple of years. Great. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, Bye. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye.